Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you could join us today and thank you for um, standing by as we work out these these last minute details. I would like to thank Sutherland Weston and the team here at Jobs in ME for spearheading this event and taking it from an idea to reality. Also, thank you to our panelists and their willingness to share experiences with the business community. Um, welcome to Katie Longley from the Jackson Laboratory, Michael Ballesteros from Puritan Medical Products, Mary Dysart Hart and Jordan Dysart from Dysart's Restaurant. The current staffing crisis in Maine is a widespread problem with the lack of engagement from our labor force affecting businesses across multiple industries, both large and small. We have probably all heard the question, where have all the workers gone? There are many open positions, not enough applicants. And when a qualified candidate applies, they often cancel or are a no-show for the interview. Or they show up for the interview, get hired, and then don't show up for the first day at work. So how do we engage a workforce that has disengaged? Today, we will hear from a diverse set of main business leaders on what has worked for them and what has not. Katie, can you start by telling us your hiring story? Good afternoon. Uh, it's nice to be with everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Longley. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Lab. And let me just tell you a little bit about us, because even though this is mostly a main audience, some folks don't know what we do. And uh, we try to spread the word. So the Jackson Laboratory is a nonprofit biomedical research institution. We're truly global now with locations in Connecticut, California, and Asia. In Maine, where we're focused today, we employ approximately 1,600 people. And we have like many of you, many open positions. We have 170 open positions currently. These are all types of jobs, hourly, frontline, technicians, IT positions, lab managers, building trades, uh, data science, research, and administration. So our challenges are like your challenges in sourcing and acquiring new talent. We have an amazing team, talent team, who recruits with the latest online tools and in person. But to respond to today's challenges, I would mention a few lessons we've learned. And we're, you know, we're all learning this together. It's a journey. Um, certainly being flexible uh, and decisive. Uh, I think those are our two really big takeaways. Uh, being flexible in the ability to offer hybrid and remote positions. And that's opened up a whole new world of talent. Now, it doesn't work for every job, but it does for many jobs. For instance, just last week, we hired an IT professional from San Diego who will be fully remote. That was not possible a year ago. Again, we've learned you need to act quickly and decisively. We, if you, you know, in the old days, we took a while to get back to people. These are people sometimes who have multiple offers, like you said, um, that then they may take something else while they're speaking to you. We have an example where we hired a lead research librarian earlier this year. He applied on a Thursday. We flew him up from Texas. We flew him up the following week to Bar Harbor. And this all credit goes to our talent acquisition team here, not me. He needed a place to live with his dog. And we were able to find him uh, temporary housing for six weeks. And all of this was done in a matter of like nine days. So acting quickly is, gonna, is really paying dividends. We're also building more pipelines. We're going back out to high schools, we're offer, we offer one of our first internship programs this summer. We're offering apprenticeships with local educational institutions, voc tech institutions, of course, the university and the community colleges. And last but not least, trying to turn a negative into a positive, recruiting for on-site positions in this part of the state, this beautiful part of the state, down East Maine, is really attractive for lifestyle reasons. So um, don't undersell the beauty of Maine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, probably all of you have heard of Puritan Medical because of, of COVID-19. And, and um, uh, for those of you who don't know, we, we produce the majority of the COVID-19 swabs um, that are shipped not only in the United States, but uh, around the world as well. Um, in the last two years, um, hiring has been a big deal to us because we've opened up three uh, additional production facilities, two within the state of Maine uh, to join our uh, flagship campus 
in uh, Guilford, but also we've moved outside of the state of Maine and now have a, a facility in Portland, Tennessee, which is where I am right now. But um, anyway, we, uh, we've we had a lot of trouble hiring, not only frontline people, but um, engineering and uh, management. Um, as Katie stated, we, we ha have also had to be very flexible in many of the roles that we uh, are trying to fill. Uh, we have uh, included remote as uh, uh, a, a new option and hybrid, if we can make that happen. We just recently hired um, a, a regulatory specialist um, that is going to be working from home most of the time, but also um, have an office in our plant in just outside of Nashville. So um, that has helped us uh, immensely being able to be flexible. Um, for the, for the frontline people, I want to touch on that because I think um, we're all having a, a hard time or many of us are having a hard time finding those frontline people for our facilities. Obviously, we're production facilities and we need to have people on the machines, operating the machines and fixing the machines. And so um, it's, it's one of the areas that we put a lot of time and effort into and, and what we have found to be helpful is to what is the message of the company? Um, what's the impact with the products that, that you make or that we make? And, and telling a story about um, uh, the company and how you as an operator or you as a technician fit into um, what we do and why that's important. Um, that's a pretty easy story in the last you know, couple of years. Um, but um, we were uh, very successful in swab production um, before COVID hit, and, and we make diagnostic products and swabs that cover the gamut of the medical industry. And so um, our message really hasn't changed that much. It's the, just how do, how do you present it? Um, and then uh, not only your message and how people that come to work for you um, um, fit into that, but also what are our, our expectations um, for that person? And so I think that crafting the message and setting the expectations will really help drive people and find people that really would be a good fit. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, and Mary, can you tell us your hiring story? I sure can. Um, just to give you a little bit about Dice Arts, we're a family business. My dad opened it 55 years ago. At that time, we had about 30 employees. Now we have just shy of 400. We started with a fuel business, fixing trucks, and a restaurant. Now we have convenience stores. We have, I don't know, we, we keep coming up with new ideas and new things to be doing. So um, it keeps our little minds occupied. Uh, as we look back over the years, it's all about appreciating our employees. Um, many, many of our employees have started as teenagers, especially in um, the restaurant world. We are people's first job. So we've had people start in the restaurant. They've stayed with the restaurant. Uh, or we have one really wonderful boy who started, I think he was a busser, went on to be a cook. Now he's one of our top employees and one of our lube aspects of things. So, you know, it's that being able to find talent when they're young and having them stay with us has been really what we've tried to do. Uh, probably that same thing is part of our problem now as well, in that so many of these people who have been with us who started as teenagers are now grandparents and they are retiring. So, you know, valuable, um, highly necessary part of our business, they hit retirement age, as I have. Um, so with me is my nephew, Jordan, who's taken my job, and I will send him over to you. So one of our biggest challenges in the last few years is pre-COVID, we maybe had 10 to 15 applications for any given job opening. Now we're maybe get one or two to fill said role. And with those one or two, we need to act quickly across um, a multitude of platforms too that we have these job postings on. And if we don't respond in a very fast manner and in a manner in which this potential applicant um, is looking for, then they'll go move on to another opportunity. 
Um, but that, that's been one of the big things we've been dealing with. And I do feel like it is better now than it was even a year ago at this point. However, a lot of our workforce has gotten, we've always been pretty young in terms of uh, a lot of our frontline workers and a lot of them high school, college age kids. Uh, we, a lot of our jobs are a lot of people for their first jobs that they've ever had. Um, but now it's just, that's a very big bulk of our workforce. We have a core group of people who've been with the company for a while, but filling these other positions, it's 16, 17, 18 year old kids. And I think a lot of the reasons why we've had a lot of our issues in the last few years is a lot of those kids weren't working through COVID. So a lot of these kids are coming in a little bit older in high school, say um, senior or freshman in college um, with their first ever job. And that in itself has been a little bit of a challenge to say the least, but it's it's nice to see that's rebounding where we were um, even 18, uh, 12 months ago. Um, but slowly but surely it's getting better, but there's still a lot of room for improvement, that's for sure. Um, and a lot of it too is we're in a lot, we're in a multitude of industries and um, certain jobs are able to be filled a lot faster than others. Like say our trucking department, we haven't been able to find help whatsoever. And a lot of our employees are getting close to retirement age. Um, we're working on recruiting, but a lot of people, um, especially in Maine, I mean, it's hard to drive down our average age with truckers when we've, We've had a few new applicants, but most of those ones have been in their 50s or 60s. Um, it's a hard industry to get people right out of college, but there's a lot of programs that are working on getting kids class A licenses and all that. But it's a very big responsibility too for a 18, 19 year old, 21 year old coming out of school to go haul petroleum or diesel around in a, a big truck. I mean, that that's something that you kind of have to work up to as well. So we'll see, but. I do, I feel it's more promising now than it was, that's for sure. Thank you, Dylan. How has the pandemic changed your view of recruiting and how has it impacted those in your HR department who are actually doing the work? So um, great question. I think I mentioned before a few tools and we've all talked about hybrid and remote work, obviously new offerings. We're also looking at things like part-time work, which has not been, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, full-time positions, so we're trying to, again, creatively think about, are there ways we could attract parts of the workforce or for fewer hours a week? We are stressing our benefits a lot. Jax is fortunate, really fortunate to have great benefits. And one of the benefits that attracts new employees, new hires, are, is our educational benefit and our tuition reimbursement. But I think our HR department is looking at new and creative ways to recruit, um, but more importantly, looking at ways to retain. So, you know, we don't want to kill ourselves to fill positions and, you know, and then we know in the hybrid work environment, all the statistics are saying you're going to have high, higher turnover because if you have a truly remote position, that means you can work for anyone. So uh, we know those positions may turn over more rapidly. So the focus now is retention. And we know that this means looking at the whole employee experience. What's really important to many of our hires and existing employees is what Mike talked about is our mission, which is to cure disease. This really resonates. And I think we're stressing our mission um, across the organization and especially in recruiting. Those values um, are very important to the demographic, to some of uh, our younger hires, of course, to everybody at the lab, but something that's become uh, really a focus in, in recruiting. And then wanting to know where you fit into that. So if you're a custodian or if you're a mouse worker or uh, anywhere in the organization, how you are contributing to our mission to cure disease. Those are great points. Um, Mike, how about how about you? How How is your HR department doing their work and uh, how has their view changed? Well, the pandemic really changed us in us trying to find a strategy to be able to still be around or see or interview several hundred people, um, many, uh, uh, you know, every week in order to find the number of people that we needed. And how do we do that safely? Not only for um, the public that's coming in to possibly job interview with us or, or our, our employees. So what we did is we, we set up a new structure of uh, evaluating people that we meet with, whether that be our frontline employees or, or, or employees in general that come to work. 
we everybody has to go through a, sim, a symptom a review in, in the morning. And, and an actual, uh, we've got these automated face scanners that uh, take your temperature and you just have to walk up to one and look in to the screen and it automatically tells you whether you have a fever or not. Some, some pretty cool stuff that we implemented in order to make sure that uh, people walking into the facility, whether they were um, uh, looking for a job or whether they were working, had any type of symptom. If people did have symptoms, then we, we, had, we had several COVID tests available so that we could provide a COVID test in order to direct them on which way to go. So, you know, putting up that uh, safety net for us to be able to still interact with the public and interact with our employees was huge for us because it continued to allow us to get the number of people we needed um, uh, through the doors, whether that was for work or whether that was to be interviewed. So um, it was an important piece that we did. That's how it changed us. Mm, interesting. And Jordan, can you tell us how, how the pa pandemic has changed you and how is your HR department doing their work? So a lot of our positions aren't exactly the easiest in terms of going remote with, but we've come a long ways in terms of being able to have that option for people um, at, at certain job titles anyway, that's for sure. Um, but uh, our big thing is that we've been able to make it so we have a much more flexible work environment for a lot more, a lot of people, especially a lot of these younger kids who are in high school or in college. Um, if they have like some hours of availability in the morning or something like that, say maybe they work three hours in the morning and then go home for a little bit and go do some homework and then come back for the night rush. I mean, in the restaurant world, it's kind of set up that way that you're able to do that. But we're even we're doing this in our convenience stores as well, which is a very um, similar group of people working um, within these stores. Um, it's just being flexible. And a lot of the big thing is just communication, communication, communication with everybody and just seeing what they're comfortable with, what they want to be doing, um, what they're looking for in this role, how they want to grow in the company. Uh, we found a lot of success in uh, hiring people to be dishwashers and those dishwashers come turn into being some of your best employees and then you move them up to being a line cook and then maybe someday being a manager. And that way through growth, we've seen um, di dividends have been paid out from that um, throughout the years. And um, we just, it's something we love to see anyway, too, so. Actually, that makes me think um, I, the, the comment that I have heard a lot recently is, is the best way to uh, hire a new employee is to keep an employee. Um, it, I know, Katie, you talked about retention, that I think that's one of the things right now that we need to be aware of. So the next question is, and we're going to start with, with Michael on, on this, um, when organizations recruit, they generally tell success stories of those in the company. How have your company's stories changed over time, um, especially given the changing needs of candidates? Well, uh, because we're such an old company, we do have several um, stories of people uh, that have worked for us out of high school. And we also have several stories of people that um, several generations of their families have worked for the company. And so, you know, it's easy to tell those, right? And uh, what, what, what we also try to do is, is some of our newer people that we may have recruited from um, away or that, or, or that we may have taken out of college or out of high school and uh, have come to work for us and then become very uh, proficient or, or an expert or a SME, for lack of a better term, um, sub, a subject matter expert in what we do, because there are not many people that produce swabs or many companies that produce swabs and manufacture them the way that we do. And so when we get people like that, that come to work for us, um, that uh, not, didn't necessarily have, have been with us for a long time, but have gained success or gained knowledge, we love to talk about them. And that helps us recruit um, um, from not only the high schools, but also from the rural communities. And, and I think it's a, a story's impactful 
And, and actually, the, uh, we'd like to talk also about what we, the pay opportunities that we have. We've also recently just um, raised some of our entry level rates as many of our, uh, our fellow companies have done. And that's really been uh, uh, a high point in the last couple of months. Interesting. Mary, uh, how would you answer that question um, about success stories and how those stories have changed over time? I think that, um, you know, so much of it is similar to the way it has been, but it's that being very able to do, as Jordan said, to try and work around what people's schedules are. Instead of being, you know, it used to be that we would have everybody start who was starting in the restaurant, start at five o'clock at night, and they'd work either to midnight until two. We're closing at eight o'clock now. So our 24 seven world is gone. Now we can say you can come in at five and you can work until eight. So, you know, some of those sort of things make um, recruiting much easier for students. Um, we won't talk about what the students do after eight o'clock, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, just that whole flexibility to be able to work with people so that they're able to come in and do the best job. Excellent. And Katie? Sure. Well, our stories change naturally, given that we've you know, been on a growth trajectory a bit, and we're now global, as I mentioned. I saw a coworker at lunch today in our communications department, and he was so excited to meet his counterparts at our Japanese uh, plant today. And how exciting to be in rural Maine and have those global connections. So telling those types of stories really excites our employee base and our recruits. Um, we have a lot of, uh, just as Puritan and Dice Arts have a lot of longevity. People, uh, one of our longtime uh, security uh, people, he's retiring next week, I think after 37 years at the lab. And we have multiple generations that have worked here too. But we're also trying to bring in uh, new people and diverse um, candidates across all our uh, diverse employees. And we're trying to educate our managers so we can make uh, a lot of people feel welcome um, at Jax, and uh, um, no matter if you've been, you know, a long-term Mainer or uh, you're new to America. So um, those are some of uh, the success stories I think we're having. Nice. Now, you all have talked about flexibility and or remote work, and you've all addressed a little bit how, how you handle that. But is there anything um, extraordinary or or especially different that you have have offered or are able to offer to um, potential employees that has helped you um, to acquire new new hires? Probably, you know, maybe it's not new, but what we have had in the past went away during COVID was some of the co-op aspects of working with our local high schools and working with the Hudson students and the University of Maine students, because we're very lucky to have both of them right in our neighborhood. And so, you know, as Jordan sort of said, we're, we're working with this, how do we get young people to want to be able to come? And um, especially with the co-ops, we always have been able to have the students who are a high school come in at noon, whenever it was they were getting out. So, it's sort of building those first time employee relationships. Excellent. And, and Katie? I think one of our exciting new initiatives we started about a year ago was uh, voluntary, time, voluntary time off. It, it, uh, a way to officially recognize contributions back to your community, no matter which site you're on. And that can be an organized event, like we're doing a, an Alzheimer's walk in Bangor this weekend, or it can be your your favorite charity uh, that you spend time with um, or a school. And that has resonated a lot uh, to be able to give two full, uh, two eight hour uh, days credit um, at the expense of, of the lab for voluntary time off. Uh, and it, again, it, it, it connects people to the organization and to the mission. Um, a couple of other things we've done recently, and it does, it does require 
an investment in infrastructure, and we feel very fortunate to have the resources to do that is we've uh, just opened up some workforce housing in Bar Harbor and uh, with affordable rents for some of our employees. And we are going to be opening a second daycare facility. What we already have one in Ellsworth with the Downey's Family Y for Jack's employees. And then we're going to be opening another one uh, a little over a year from now in, um, in Bar Harbor. So those are some of the exciting new things we're doing. It does take an investment, and sometimes um, there's you know a short-term outflow of money. But I think in the long term, and, and we're all in it for the long haul, right? Um, these are the kinds of things you need to think about. Those are fantastic ideas, um, Mike. How how about you? One of the things that comes to mind is um, when you get a large group uh, of people working together. I, it's important for you to be able to share the experiences that you have across the sites. And uh, especially with our engineering, regulatory, quality, and, and technicians groups, we, we often have them uh, cross-train and, and do visits to the other sites to experience some of the um, uh, troubles that uh, the other sites are dealing with, how the teams at those sites uh, work through those issues, and um, build camaraderie across um, the organization through that cross training, that uh, interaction. And so we have really found some uh, really great benefits from new ideas um, and new training experiences, learning experiences that come from that uh, collaboration. And people get to travel, right? They get to go and see other things, uh, other things and other places. And, and it's really an, a great opportunity. I always like to travel. Um, okay, those are all great answers. Um, so another topic that we seem to hear from employers is wage pressure and inflation. Are you seeing this in your businesses and how are you addressing it? Like Puritan, we did a big wage initiative last summer. Uh, we, we had to, and it was the right thing to do for our hourly workers. Um, I think the way we're obviously watching inflation and, and the looming recession closely, um, we're really focused a lot on pay equity and, and always looking at that, but also making sure we have very competitive benefits. So half of the equation is, you know, the take home pay and the other half is your benefits. And we're very proud of having a good medical plan, great retirement plan with a great employer match. Um, like I indicated before, you know, tuition, a uh, good tuition benefit reimbursement plan. And then one thing that we've done, which really helps with the inflation um, and cost of living is our transportation program. So JAX has one of the largest employee commuting transportation programs in the state, and we subsidize that. So we're here, I think we had 10,000 commuter trips last year. This year, it's probably going to be closer to 14,000. And that's because of the cost of gasoline, right? So we have a big uptick in our um, buses. Two thirds of our employees commute from off island. And so the buses are a great benefit um, and timely with, with uh, the inflationary impact, impact on oil. That's awesome. Um, Mike, how about you? Uh, it's similar to, um, um, I'm sure, Dysarts and the Jackson Laboratory. We also, uh, you know, looked at our wages and wanted to make sure that they were competitive. Um, we also uh, are offering, going to be offering soon, uh, or updating our, our uh, paid time off program. We're going to uh, do an increase there. We also are looking into how do we um, have a more robust employee engagement program where we're working um, with uh, uh, people from all of the sites on um, engaging them in discussions about what we're doing, how we're doing it, um, and getting more direct employee feedback um, uh, from, from this uh, new program in, in order to help us make decisions about where we go, what we do, and, and, and how we uh, support our employees. And so um, those, those programs all came from how do we make it better from the people that you know, make us successful. Nice. Jordan, um, how are you handling wage pressure and inflation? Well, in the last few years, the inf we've really seen inflation hit us more than 
Uh, we see it on our day to day just with our rising fuel costs with our we see the diesel up over $5 and that has a direct impact on how much we're paying for our food. But it also is, we can see it directly right to our menu prices and our employees can see that as well. So it's just staying on top of it as best as we can. Um, a lot of independent restaurants do not offer um, a lot of benefits where we feel like one of the things that sets us apart is our full-time employees have can have full benefits. And that includes PTO, um, vacation time, um, health care, vision care for the whole family. And we've always had a very competitive package. Um, but with the way that the inflation's gone in the last few years, it's something that just needs to be monitored every single day. Like we need to go through our list of what everybody's making. We're like, okay, is this matching up with what it should be? And um, that in itself is, uh, that's a, that can be a full-time job just monitoring that. Um, those are all great um, answers. Um, we have all read or heard about the great resignation, quiet quitting, and other terms to dis, uh, describe the current state of employee engagement. How are your companies keeping people engaged and happy other than giving them uh, more money and better benefits? <laughs> or maybe those are the reasons. Um, and Mike, why don't we start with you? Well, I think it, it, with with any um, retention program, you have to have benefits and and those things involved. Um, I think that if you're competitive and and you um, make sure that uh, your employees have access to to adequate services, then you usually have a chance to retain them. The, the other thing that's important uh, for, for many employees is number one, feel that they're part of something, that their opinion matters, and that um, you they, they, they can make a difference. And so um, we do a lot of training with our supervisors and management team about um, engaging uh, with employees, about listening to employees, um, and, and making sure that there's a voice throughout the company for either employee concerns, uh, employees' great ideas, uh, and making sure that um, we can direct them in the right place to, to, to be heard. And um, it's, it's an important part of where we're going in the future and, and how we're going to continue to, to retain people. Nice. Jordan? Yeah, our, our biggest thing is just communication with one another. It doesn't need to be anything too crazy, but just having a sit down with one of our employees, whether it be a server or one of our fuel drivers, just seeing how they're doing. I mean, you can get a lot of great ideas that way too. And that's how we've grown as a company over the years. It's a very much a family business. And a lot of our employees have been with us for years and years. And if something's wrong or um, they want to see improvement in a certain area, a lot of the, a lot of the time, their insight is what we we just need to hear as a company, whether it be a manager or ownership. It's just that that's how you grow, and that's also how the company itself and the employees um, are included in just helping you move forward as a whole. Great, and and Katie, um, how are you keeping your people engaged and happy? Well, Jordan, I, I just want to say that that's so important. The listening. And meeting with employees, I mean, it's really basic, right? It's yeah. human nature. One of my favorite things to do as a COO is meet with new employees about 60 to 75 days after they've been hired, after they've been through orientation, and just ask them what's on their mind, what's working, what's not working. And, and that's often where we get our best, best information, so those communications. But I would say in an organized way, what are we doing? We're really looking at the workplace and workspace of the future. Um, so if you are working on one of our sites, is it uh, an, uh, an engaging place to be working? Is it welcoming? Um, and what can we do to make your work experience on site better? You know, does the technology work? You know, are our hoteling spaces clean and safe? Um, so those are some of uh, a few of the things that we're doing uh, to make people feel engaged. And uh, we also have formed a, a several what we call employee resource groups over the last year as part of our DEI initiatives. And that's a great uh, source of engagement. So we have a women in science uh, group uh, that started in our Connecticut office and now involves uh, female scientists throughout the organization. And um, having those ERGs, what they're called, 
um, forming those can be a great engagement tool, getting back again to retention and that, that sense of belonging, right? And it's always nice to find out how people are doing um, right after they're hired, as opposed to waiting to do an exit interview when they're on their way out the door, right? When it's too late to, to re-engage them. What would be a great recommendation for a company of any size dealing with current workforce issues? Um, you know, I'm, I made reference before about being a 24-7 business. And we always joke that if plan A didn't work, we go on to plan B. And I think many times we made it to plan Z. I think with the current way everything is, is you have to be really flexible and be trying to think out of the box of what is working, what is not working, and how can we make things better? I, I have um, always liked to travel, and I used to come back to work after having a trip, and one of our my favorite servers used to say to me, oh man, she's been gone, we're gonna have to have change. <laughs> and you know, you really recognize as a whole, people don't like change, but you have to you have to have change to be able to keep growing. Absolutely. Mike? Uh, if it was, was advice that I would give is if you haven't already done so, craft your message to your potential employees, to the people that you want uh, to come and work for you. And, and then the message may change subtly depending on the mar- the target market that you're looking for. Um, but what, what are your core messages to the people that you want to get interest in your business and, and stick to those and refine those so that you're speaking about them often, that you have them um, when you're interviewing people. And, and that will really help you get your message out. And then the, it'll help you also not get people that, that really probably won't fit into your type of business not to come because they'll see what you're looking for. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be able to evaluate, well, hey, that's not me. And so um, you'll, you'll, you'll not, not only get people that want to work for you, but probably um, not have to deal with people that really don't. So I, 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 I say craft that message and, and have it be a, a, a big part of what you do when you're recruiting. Excellent advice. It's all about marketing your company, isn't it? Um, and Katie. So look, if we learned anything from the past few years, it's we have to be flexible and nimble, as, as Mary said, and we've all made it through, right? And um, the future's bright. Uh, my advice would be to try new things. I saw a great visual earlier this week and I thought about it for today. And it was a picture of a group of people climbing Mount Everest and they were all holding on to the, the ropes and climbing together. And that visual, you know, they make it to the top usually. Um, so it's an uphill battle, but I like the fact that, you know, we're in it together. And I think one of the wonderful things about being and living in Maine is uh, we can all work together. We can learn from each other. We have great resources um, and we need to try new things. Okay, so let's get to the um, the questions that some of our attendees have asked. Um, Michael, what are the ways in which you are telling your impact stories? Well, there's a couple of uh, ways that we do it. We often create videos. Um, that's uh, uh, we use externally when we um, are trying to recruit. The other thing that we do is at each of the facilities, we um, um, actually uh, t- take stories from our employees and actually post them on our monitors for people to see. And whether it's um, a great job that they did um, in the recent past on the floor or whether something exciting has happened to them um, in their personal life. Uh, one thing that we did uh, a few months ago is at one of the factories, we had a group of people that um, decided to participate in a group um, uh, in, in looking at waste on uh, uh, production machines. And so it, it, it lasted for about six weeks. And after um, uh, we were done with that project. Um, the management team at that site actually created a plaque and signed it, and then we put it up in our lobby, thanking those people individually for for the work that they did. 
And so that's how we really talk about, we really wanna make it personal. We wanna uh, make sure that uh, other employees and other members of our community understand what we're doing. And the way to do that is to really make it visible. Uh, here's a question. I'm going to throw it out there to whoever has an answer. Or maybe you all have an answer. Rachel says, I often hear from job seekers that they don't hear back from employee employers when they apply to jobs on job boards, even though they are totally qualified. They often don't hear anything back or get an automated email telling them that they are not selected for an interview. Do any of you actually look at resumes that are rejected to see if maybe they were rejected needlessly. So maybe the question is who determines whether or not the person matches the job and um, should have a, an interview? Well, I can answer that real quickly. Um, at at uh, Puritan, uh, we, we have recruiting staff that, that uh, uh, go ahead and do the first pass on any resume or application that we get. Um, we, in some of uh, some instances, not all, but some instances, we do have further review of those um, applications. And, and if we, if we um, find that there's something there that we want to, uh, you know, look, take a, a closer look at, then we absolutely will pull that from the, uh, from the pile and, and um, give that person a, a call. Often it's more of a, of a phone call than in, in, in more of a probing uh, type of interaction so that we can just clarify some things, but we will do that. We don't do that in every case, but, but uh, especially in our specialty areas, we, we might do that. I will add a question to that. Um, I believe one of you mentioned a, um, a pipeline. Do you use um, applications, um, to, do those go into your pipeline for potential future openings? We're pretty, care we're careful about if we get a resume, but we, again, with 170 openings, our talent team will say, well, it may not work for this position, but it may work for others. So we're doing a really, a much more intensive job of sharing the type of candidates coming through the door so that they get, you know, dispersed widely. Uh, and not necessarily totally relying on the on the search tool for qualifications. And let's face it, not everybody has 100% of the qualifications and that's where that human interaction uh, that Mike talked about before, probing, calling them, hey, well, you know, can you do this? We couldn't tell from your resume. So you have to look beyond the resume. Um, Lisa is asking, are you finding better attendance in virtual career fairs or in-person events? Have you done both virtual career fairs and in person? We have done both, and it's our my perspective, and I think um, uh, my HR team's perspective that that uh, you know the um, um, face to face it works better. Um, and but you know what, the, everything that we do to recruit people, there there are pros and cons, right? And so you you just have to go with the flow and and try to work around them. I mean, um, um, both um, methods are, are great because you can't always get in front of people um, face to face. So you just, you just have to make whatever, uh, whatever uh, ever uh, method work well for you. Yeah, ditto. And we're doing a lot more screening by Zoom and that from a travel and convenience really can speed up the interview process. Um, so uh, I think in-person's coming back. We're going out to high schools, uh, which we weren't before. But uh, as Mike, you, Mike said, you have to use every channel you can, you can get. Here's an anonymous question. Each organization's talent acquisition team can only go so far. How does each organization empower their employees to help with the recruitment process? So, um, Colin, we started a program a couple of years ago that uh, really is based on employee referrals. And it incents our employees, if they refer someone to Jax, they get hired and that they're still here after six months, um, they get a uh, cash compensation for that. And it's really, it's, it's great, it's a win-win, right? Um, and sometimes we have to remind people, they'll say, oh, I had a friend apply and we have to send, do you remember to make sure that they said that you referred them? <laughs> um, because some people don't even know about the program. Um, but look, we're all in this together. Our HR team can't do it without our managers. Um, our managers can't do it without our TA team. 
and uh, we're all in the hiring process together. And I think it's a mistake if, if people blame it on HR. It's 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 not HR's sole responsibility to have a successful recruiting program. Because we're all in it together, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And and I will just uh, jump on what Katie said real quick. Is we also have a referral program that we uh, use at, at um, Puritan. And the the other thing that we do is we actually uh, ask um, our folks from the production floor, whether that's an entry level position or managers. Um, we we ask people, would you like to join us in um, you know, the career fair events or the hiring events that we do? And we often get people that want to join us and talk about what they do and give um, potential employees a different perspective than what HR staff can do. Curious if the current hiring market, this is the question, the hiring market, current hiring market is phase one of the retirement of the baby boomer generation. And is that a concern? I mean, we've been talking about the great retirement even way before the uh, pandemic in terms of the, the, you know, millions of people that will retire. Um, I think it goes both ways. I think the average retirement age has gotten later, you know, 70 is the new 60 or 75 is the new 65. Um, but demographically, the numbers speak for themselves. There's, there are going to be more retirements coming up. And, um, uh, but I also think there are more people in the workplace. And there's been some recent studies I saw in the Wall Street Journal that there's uh, an older demographic that's coming back to work. Um, and, and that when I talked about that part-time uh, uh, opportunity, uh, I think we just, again, need to be creative, but we certainly can't avoid the numbers, which are there are going to be a great number of retirements. And so that pipeline we talked about, the high schools, the apprenticeships, the working with the schools, critical. We had an internship program uh, this summer our first one um, in person uh, in our mouse production facility with kids from local schools, Ellsworth Brewer. It was wonderful and they loved it. And when I went to their closing ceremony, they said, we would have never ever considered working at the lab. We had such a tremendous um, experience. We either wanna to go to college and life sciences or we wanna come back next summer. So uh, I think again, one of the solutions to the great retirement is is that, uh, is that pipeline from the schools. I'm an example of the great retirement. I never would have retired, but my husband has younger onset Alzheimer's. So you have no choice, but you need to retire. And I think that there's a lot of uh, people out there who are finding themselves in some sort of a situation that, you know, there's, they're, <laughs> With us, we're also facing a mother-in-law who has a problem. And so, you know, it's that whole double-edged um, reasons that people end up having to retire that really isn't maybe what they want to be doing. In relation to employee retention, what is the biggest set of tools that your business can deploy for your current employees? And what, how long do those take to, to get added? I would say, you know, career paths, you know, we, we're looking closely at you've got to have a reason to stay. And if you feel, we already talked about um, benefits, we already talked about engagement, but there also has to be that personal satisfaction and a, and a path forward. So I think we, we've recently been looking more closely at career paths. If you haven't moved out of your position or been promoted within a few years, you're going to start looking. Um, so I would say that's a, that's a new tool we're looking at, how long it will take to deploy I think we'll have to do it. We'll have to segment it, but hopefully quickly. We're we're doing the same same thing. We we um, we want to make people uh, aware of any opportunity, other opportunities uh, for them. And what's great um, about Puritan, and I would uh, say the lab as well, is there are new, there are different departments that have engineering and or um, you know uh, 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 regulatory. Um, jobs that you could go into and, and, and the opportunity for you to go to school while you're working and learn a new trade or a new career is, uh, is also available. So I, I, those are the things that we're, we really want to make sure people understand that they have the opportunity to do while they're working. Um, also get that entry level training that you might not ha have a chance to, to do um, if you were just uh, going to school. Um, and the last thing that we've done when we did our, our pay increases that we put 
steps in those pay increases dependent upon what you're able to do. So you, at, at the entry level might be, you're, you're able to run, uh, to run one machine in a certain section. If you're able to run two machines, you go up to the next notch. And then if, if you're able to run three machines, then you go to the highest notch as an example. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've given them the opportunity to uh, be able to earn more money and um, either uh, learn a new skill or, or join a new department. Our biggest thing is um, just making uh, employees aware of other openings throughout the company. We've always had a lot of people moving around to different departments, and we have that flexibility to be able to do so. I mean, even recently, we had a um, employee working in our store at the truck stop, and she very quickly rose up through the ranks, and now she's our head uh, accounts payables person, and all in a span of six months. Um, but it's, it's kind of cool to see people um, grow and move off into different departments. That's fast. Yeah. Good for her. Okay. Uh, in relation to rising wage pressure, what is the limiting factor in considering increased wages for employees to become market leaders rather than staying in the average for pay? Is the benefit of offering the best employment in your area considered in terms of hiring new employees and retaining valuable workers? I don't think any of us would be so presumptuous to say we're the best employer in the area, you know, and, and we want to, we want to be mindful of our, you know, sister and brother companies in the area, but certainly you want to be an employer of choice, right, where uh, you have great, a great story to tell, as I think um, the panelists, have, the other panelists have done today, and be attractive, but I, I, I'm not sure if I completely understand the question, but if it's to toot your own horn that you're a good employer, sure. You, you want to do that, uh, but not to the detriment of, of others. No, I think it, I think it's about about um, uh, sharing what what you as an employer have to offer and and making sure that people are, are um, evaluating that against other opportunities. Your message needs to be positive and what you what you can possibly do here and how does that align with um, with what uh, your potential employee wants for their own you know career path? Right. Okay. And finally, are there any marketing strategies that any of you have taken that have really yielded results? Have you wrapped social. your car with your brand? <laughs> I think social media has been a game changer. Um, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, all, all the all the social media, Facebook, uh, the, for recruiting, it, it's, as I said before, many channels but they have paid a, a lot of dividends for us. A couple of things that we considered um, is we didn't do, but we considered like giving a car away um, <laughs> that we would make open to all employees, not just the ones we were hiring, but, you know, come to work for us and, and uh, you could win a car. And, and that changed a little bit. We, we thought about it, uh, you know, about a four wheeler and other things. We didn't get there because at the, in the end, we didn't, think that was, um, you know, going to really work as well as we thought, but we did consider it. So um, it's, it's always interesting to try and come up with the, the next best thing, right? Desperate times call for desperate measures, right? <laughs> uh, anything unusual that Jackson Lab has done? Or Dice Arts? I don't, I don't think it's anything crazy. It's more just being present and consistent across all your platforms. I mean, you're not, Rome wasn't built in a day. I mean, <laughs> you just need to be there, be present. And just the biggest thing is just getting back to people as soon as you can and um, just being transparent, so. Yeah, I think we try to have fun. You know, you, you can't lose the fun in, in work, um, but you know, we're, we're not giving cars away yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do any of you have any closing thoughts that you would like to share? I would just say uh, to those of you out there, uh, businesses that are struggling, um, don't give up. Um, you know, the, the, the market um, seems to be, from, from our perspective, uh, at Puritan getting better. Um, and I think that, um, you know, take, take some of the advice that uh, we've given you today and, and look at how you might craft a better message or um, reach out to uh, groups of people that you uh, might not have thought of doing uh, so in the past. 
uh, will probably uh, help help in in uh, getting you some new people. Yeah, don't give up hope. And we're all in Maine, and it's a great place to work, and we can help each other as well. So feel free to reach out to any of us for tips. Um, I'm happy to connect people to our HR department um, and and others for for more detail. All right. Thank you all so much, um, Michael and Katie and Mary and Jordan. Um, this has been really helpful. I hope that um, lots of people found good information. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.